uh, council. Uh, Christina is here joining me. She's our um, exec council secretary. Um, and just wanted to welcome you all. And uh, as I was just discussing with our uh, esteemed speakers this evening, I guess finally explain what this is about because they remain confused. So <laughs> why are we here? I think about uh, a year ago, uh, some of my classmates and I were sitting around, uh, you know, us included, trying to figure out um, a way to keep in mind why we are at Georgetown, what makes this place special, um, what's unique about our heritage and tradition. Um, and we just decided to work on hearing from the people that shaped it, that form our tradition, that make this um, the great place that it is. And uh, we're very grateful to have so many people that have helped us, Dean Mitchell's office, um, Ms. Mikey Cassidy, Dean Jones, Tess, so many people, if, I'm sorry I don't mention you all, but thank you so much for all your help, and Allie Whalen, who uh, has been the like, heart and soul of putting this all together and making all of these happen, so thank you very much for all your hard work, and um, thank you all for being here, and welcome to the show. So not that long ago, the students who went to VHC on rotation for medicine were treated to something really special called the Rack and Knoll Show which was a combination of hazing and teaching uh, in the morning report with Dr. Rakowski and Dr. Nolan. And then it morphed into the Nolan Holman show. And so tonight we thought we'd give you a little sample of that. So without further introduction, Dr. Nolan and Dr. Holman. He's in charge. Well, I finally found out what it's about. <laughs> but in, anyway, uh, thank, thank you all for coming. I learned that at Disney World. We say that one. <laughs> I, say, I say it on church. It's on Sunday when I hand out the notices. Thanks for coming. <laughs> you know, uh, of all the events in the history of Georgetown, the most significant, I think, was the hiring of a fellow named Dr. Harold Jagers as the first full-time head of the Clinical Department of Medicine in 1946. He was the first full-time head of any clinical department at Georgetown. Everybody, prior to that, most of the teaching was done by, well, all the teaching was done by volunteers and mostly family practitioners. Jagers had an engineering degree from RPI. He had an MD from Case. And then he uh, interned at Boston City, had two years of research at the Thorndike, came back, finished his residency, and eventually in a few years became director of the teaching service at Boston City Hospital. His picture's up in the Jagers room, and he's a big, he was a big, tall guy, sort of an ugly guy. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he, was, he was somewhat quiet and shy. Um, I think he was the original nerd. <laughs> he was, it's unbelievable, but everybody loved him. He, he was deaf in one ear, and he was pretended he was deaf in the other. So, <laughs> so he never heard anything, and he had absolutely no people skills. He would never have gotten into medical school, much less gotten the job he had here and made the changes he made. And he was called, the students called him the moose. He looked like a moose, if you go and get the pictures. He never understood that. And every year, the students would borrow a moose head from the Smithsonian and have a skit, and he'd be in it, and he'd say, what is that all about? He never got it. But the, the, the students absolutely loved him. He was focused on only one thing, medical education. Medical education for students, medical education for house staff, and medical education for practicing physicians. And I think you don't realize that back prior to World War II, all those wonderful general practitioners, many of them didn't know, weren't very well educated. They had very little training beyond medical school, and he was interested in that. He was interested in spreading out. I'll tell you about that in a second. But th that was it. He, he was, that was his only interest. That's all he cared about. Everything else confused him. He, he was the original absent-minded professor. When he arrived here, he sat in his office, and he didn't do anything, everybody thought, and they, they were critical of it. But it's a lesson. If you take a new job, don't do, try to do too much, change too much. 
That, that was his, a good lesson I learned from him. Just sit there and look out the window. <laughs> 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 now, he found out, the first thing he found out on the teaching service at the hospital, there were only 10 teaching cases. Private patients were not covered by the house there. He couldn't believe it. He said, what's going on here? So he, got to, he had to go to the private practice, and he said, hey, we're going to help you with our residents covering you. So that was the beginning. That's the first thing he did. The second thing he did, the students were all in lectures all day long from on the junior and senior year. And he went to Father McNally, who was the dean of the medical school, who was not beloved as Dr. Jacobs was. He was pretty disliked. But, but um, Father McNally didn't know the first thing about me the medical education. And this helped Jacobs a lot. Because Jagers would say, well, this is the way they do it in Boston. And, and he'd say, really? He'd say, yeah. And so he would, <laughs> well, then let's do it. <laughs> and so he, he, had, he had his foil. Anyway, Jagers got all the students out of the, uh, out of the school and onto the ward. So that was the second thing he did. And then the next thing that happened was that he noted they didn't get very good internships. They weren't getting very, they could hardly get an internship in a uh, small uh, Catholic hospital. Even if they were uh, practicing Catholics, they couldn't get the internship. They were having trouble. So he decided on a plan. He took each rotation. He would take several of the students and send them to Boston City for their rotation. And they would go up there. And what two things happened. One was the students got up there and said, hey, uh, that's, you can learn stuff in school. Let's get, let's get it going around here. So they came back all fired up to get good training programs. And the second thing is, the guys in Boston said, hey, these guys aren't so dumb as we thought. We thought all these Georgetown guys didn't know anything, and they're poorly trained. They're good kids. Let's take them. And I think that whole thing reflects, even today, into the attitude that people have about Georgetown students. And it reflects in the great internships that this group got this year, I think. I mean, unbelievable. And he, he really started the whole movement. Now, the second floor of the new hospital just opened when he got here. And so he, uh, that was medicine, second floor. And rounds started at 7.30, not to 9, work rounds. The doors were closed. There was no, nobody in and nobody out. No x-ray, no lab, none of those people. Get them out of here. We're house tests making rounds. We're learning. And on they go, seven to nine. All blood was drawn by the house staff prior to rounds. And the students drew the bloods on their patients, the routine bloods, CBC, urine, and so forth, every morning, five o'clock brought it down to the student lab and did them, and then had them ready for rounds. And that's, that was pretty organized. And so that's the way he had it. At 9 o'clock, anybody could come in that wanted. The attendings were out of this world. The attendings were out of this world, because it was during the doctor draft, which continued for a long period of time, and everybody that was an academic guy in, uh, in other places, they all wanted to come to Washington because they wanted to go to NIH, or they wanted to go to... Bethesda, which was really top-notch, or Walter Reed, another top-notch place. They were top-notch places, so we saw the best doctors. Uh, on the second floor, you know, we had Barter. Fred Barter was a visit that we had one time on 2 South. Willis Hurst, the writer of the cardiology textbook, it's like a, Gene Bronwall visited twice a year on 2 South. So he had a list of people. It was fantastic attendings. My, my intern, who, uh, got, who became Fred Bar uh, Barter's buddy, uh, went into endocrinology because of Jack George and ended up being chief of endocrinology at Ohio State. And I think his son is there now as his assistant. So Jay Jager's made all these changes. And, and, and uh, the most interesting thing about him, again, he was a big, quiet, rather unattractive guy. But we all loved him. <laughs> And he, got, he always got everything. He, everybody, he asked for something, and they'd say no, and he'd just say, thank you, and he'd go do it. <laughs>
But he lived in a hospital in June, July, and August. He lived in a hospital. And he, uh, he, he, his, he sent his family to Cape Cod for the summer. And they were probably happy to get rid of him. And, but he was just as happy to be here. And he'd wander the halls all night long. And I remember sitting on 2 South in the nurse's station one midnight, and I heard his voice say, hey, Donovan. It, he, he always called me Donovan. He didn't get any of the names right. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I never corrected him because I, fi I knew Donovan was a friend of mine and he could handle it better. I think the only way that I would be called in would be if I screwed up. And Donovan could handle it a lot better than I could. <laughs> I, met, I met Dr. Jagers um, almost 20 years later at a, in, in, uh, at, in Disney World at a meeting. He was sitting behind me and he tapped me on the shoulder and he said, Donovan, where are you now? <laughs> so I had to give him one of his answers. I said, I'm sitting right here, Dr. Jagers. <laughs> anyway, what he used to do is he would make scouting trips. You know, like baseball scouts, those are, you know, he, he was a teaching scouter. He went looking for teachers. He, he wasn't a, um, he, he wasn't looking for baseball players. He was looking for teachers and he would go to Boston every once in a while, and he'd look around, he'd wander the halls of all the different schools, and one day, he's at the Peter uh, Bent Brigham, and there's a, uh, one of the students is running by, and he said, where are you going? And he said, we're going to make rounds with the chief resident, and he says, do you mind if I come along? And the guy said, no. He went, and it was Proctor Harvey, who was the chief resident, and had spent two years, uh, but during the war, the doctors came back, uh, and they had promised them all their internships and residencies. And so some people had to wait two years or three years to get the residency. So they took a fellowship. That's how Proctor Harvey ended up in cardiology. He didn't really, like today, I don't know whether to be a cardiologist or a whatever. Proctor Harvey said, they said, hey, he said, well, what can I do for two years? Why don't you go spend two years with Sam Levine as a cardiology thing? He said, okay. So that's how he became a cardiologist. <laughs> So what, it isn't too hard, gang. Just make this decision. Pick one. <laughs> but anyway, he got two rounds with Proctor Harvey, and he asked Proctor Harvey to go to his office and talk to him, which he did. And he says, uh, Dr. Harvey, how would you like to be chief of cardiology at Georgetown? Dr. <laughs> Harvey said, what? He says, yeah, how would you like to be chief of cardiology? I liked your style and teaching and so forth. So, uh, so he offered him the job, and Harvey came. It was amazing. And, and he, 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 he picked people who like to teach. And they, they usually don't require a lot, they don't have a lot of maintenance, you know, they don't have a lot of maintenance. They don't ask for a lot, so they're perfect people. And so he, <laughs> so, and he did the same thing in endocrinology. He'd go up about every two or three years and make a different, he'd put, bring in a chief of endocrine, then he'd bring in a chief of, uh, hematology, GI, he'd bring them in each year. And Georgetown finally was building this incredible reputation. He had a filing system that he taught the second year students at a meeting like this. He would, he would have them all meet. And he, he brought three journals and he had a scissors and a, and a screwdriver and a stapler. And he taught you how to tear up your journals. And he would go like this, you know, and tear up the journals. And then he had a filing system with folders. And he put them in. So you have lupus, 20. And he taught them all, handed out the system. And all the people from that era all have files. Uh, he went, he used to go to the library every day. And he would look at the new articles that came in, the new journals that came in. There weren't as many journals as there are now. And he put a little red mark next to it. He looked through every article. He put a red mark and he'd get out a penny postcard and he'd write for a reprint. And finally, after about two years of doing it, he hired a couple of students to do it. And he had about 20 rooms full of file cabinets by the time he left here. And I, I ended up with about 20 file cabinets in a couple of rooms myself. I mean, because I followed it. It did whatever he said. But it was unbelievable. Uh, his thing. Now he also had what there was known as Jagger's poop sheets. <laughs> he would 
he would go to his file cabinet, he would go to his file cabinet, and he would get the top articles, and then he would condense them and put in bits of information that were very important, and he would add that to the file to the, and hand them out when a conference. We're having a grand rounds on ulcerative colitis. He'd go to his ulcerative colitis file, get it out, put all the good articles on it, on the thing, and a couple of pointers that he wanted. So, and then he had the Jager form, which is what he, which is well known for all the people that were here in the 50s and 60s. They were, it was about 40 pages on every ward for each patient. That's what the student history and physical was, was 40 pages. And uh, you'd have, you'd have a, a symptom and all the stuff and the physical diagnosis. You had a checklist so you wouldn't forget it. He, he, so you had to do everything. It was very compulsive. He, um, he had an idea of networking education. This is unbelievable. So he set up um, affiliations with neighboring hospitals. And he had Arlington. That's how Arlington started. He went to uh, Providence and Prince George here, but they fell folded. He had two hospitals in Buffalo, New York, a hospital in Rochester, New York, and one in Worcester. And he, he sent the faculty one week or two weeks out of the year through these places, and they would give lectures and rounds and so forth and do teaching. And, and that was his idea that the medical school would supply the teachers for, the, for this network of education. The doctors in those days, when I, I went to Arlington in 19... 55 as an intern. It was an old, dilapidated building, hardly. And the first, one of the first orders I got was have intern, uh, uh, this hypertensive patient come in, and the guy wrote the orders. Uh, the GP said, hey, have the intern take off a pint of blood off of this fellow. So they were, they were bloodletting still. So. I said, well, I don't know when I ought to be doing this. <laughs> but it does lower the blood pressure. <laughs> and, and so, and, and then he had, if, it does, if, one, if one pint doesn't do it, do the second. And so I went to the head of the lab, a guy named Bill Dolan, who's an incredibly good guy at Terra for everybody out there. But, he said, what the hell, you should be able to do it. your doctor, do it. You know, he gives you that to try to intimidate you. But I said, I feel very uncomfortable doing it. So I said, oh, we'll take care of it. So the lab did it. And they took, they took two units off the guy. And his blood pressure came down to normal. And, as, and I saw the doctor before I left there, which was three or four weeks. And as he told me, he said, the guy's blood pressure is still normal. You know, what happened? That's true. If you take a pint of blood off anybody and their blood pressure comes down, it generally stays down for a couple of months, you know. And that used to be the form of treatment before any hypertensive drugs were just coming in. <laughs> one, one of the students one day missed an exam. And so Jager said, they said, what are we going to do? And uh, Jager said, if you're reading journals, you're, you're up to date. You don't have to worry. So he, he, we used to have nicknames for all the journals. The Annals was the Gray Journal. The American Journal of Medicine was the Green Journal. So he, 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 he would ask. His question always was the same. He said, have him come to me, and I'll quiz him. I'll give him an oral quiz. And it's, he only had one question. He said, what color is the American Journal of Medicine? <laughs> Everybody knew the answer. It's green. OK, he's fine. He's reading the journals. Get him out of here. He passes. <laughs> But the best one was when he went in and he said to the kid, he says, what color is the green journal? <laughs> and the kid thought it was a trick question. So he got nervous about it. But he finally said, green. Jager said, let him go. He's OK. He had, a, he had a, uh, one other thing. He, ha he loved to have teaching cases. He had, a, he had an agreement with the nuns that the nuns ran the hospital, by the way, in those days. And he had an agreement with the nuns that if he had a very interesting case, you could bring him in and there'd be no charge. So uh, I can tell you, <laughs> tell you a couple of stories. One is this uh, guy came to the emergency room with flu-like symptoms. He had leprosy. <laughs> so Jagas was, he was so excited, it was unbelievable. <laughs> he wanted to get him in the hospital quick. And the nun said, no way, you're not putting this guy. 
you're not putting this guy in our hospital. And so uh, they had a big confrontation, and Jacob's lost. So they couldn't get him in, but he wouldn't let the guy leave the emergency room until everybody had seen the lesions of, lep of, of the leper. He, one day, he came running around the ward. Bob and I was talking about this. He came running around the ward with a coffee saucer filled with, um, um, with a stool specimen. <laughs> 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 it was it was silver. It was silver colored, silver stool. I know you most of you don't know about this, but we always we're always looking for the next case, aren't we? <laughs> anyway, what it is, it's a it's a it's it's a sign of obstruction of the biliary tree, so that you get acolic stool, and then this the cancer of the ampullavata bleeds into acolic stool and it gives you silver. So whenever you see a silver stool, think carcinoma of the ampullavata. Now, I don't think we're going to see too many of those, but someday someone is going to see one, and you'll remember dear Dr. Jake is running from ward to ward, house staff group to house staff group, look at silver stools. So, but you never forget, see? He had an agreement with NIH. He had an agreement with NIH that if they had an unusual case or they were working on unusual cases that if they, when they discharge him, if they sent him over to Georgetown for a day or two so that house staff could see him. And there was a guy there named Al Scherzman. I don't I have his name right, but he was in charge of all the carcinoids at, at NIH. And so one day, they, this guy gets discharged from NIH. They send him to Georgetown emergency room. He's got carcinoid. So in he comes. Jacob says, admit him. We admit him. And so the rest of the next two days, everybody in the house staff goes by, and we're giving the guy, we're trying to get the guy to eat. You know? and, then, and then about 15 minutes later, he flushes. He has a nice flush. And, and so anybody, it didn't have to be your patient or anything. Anybody came by, got the guy to eat. You got a nice uh, tryptophan, tryptophan flush. And everybody saw this wonderful flush. And then after about two days, everybody had seen it. They sent him home. <laughs> <laughs> There was a place. There was a place on 35th Street. Is that where the church is down there? 35th, right next to Tombs, 36. They're called Tea Hands. I don't know if you ever heard of it, but Tea Hands. Only the old timers would know. It was a del it was a New York like delicatessen place, huh? Yeah, probably. It's right in that area, and and the house staff used to hang out there. House staff and the students would hang out there. And, and uh, Jagers went in there once, and he saw him, that Mr. Tehan had clubbing of his fingers. <laughs> so he, he was so excited. He had written an article for a book called Signs and Symptoms on clubbing of the fingers. So he offered the guy to come in the hospital and do all the work up for all the causes of clubbing. Right? And I'm thinking, holy cow, what? It isn't that the workup is so intensive. But the, the poor guy has to go through the whole workup, you know. And so anyway, finally, after about a year, the guy came in. He got worked up. And while we're, while we're, <laughs> while we're in, he was on two east, <laughs> while he's just about getting his last uh, uh, barium swallow or whatever, he, we're ruling out inflammatory bowel disease and everything. And by the time we got through, uh, Everybody knows the family was all there. They were worried. They didn't know what he had. He said, where's our dad guy, you know? He said, no, no, he's fine. And we all looked, and the whole family was clubbed. <laughs> so we, we, we picked it up late. But then he was excited. <laughs> but, but, but he was excited. He was really excited because it was the first the case he'd seen of congenital clubbing, of, of, or familial, but not say congenital, familial clubbing of the stool. I had a, I once, I once tore my pants when I was an intern, and, I, <laughs> and, and we didn't have too many pants. <laughs> we had to wear white, we had to wear white pants. And I went down to um, Wisconsin Avenue, and I'm looking for a tailor, you know, and I'm going this, I saw this little dinky shop down there, so I it was the right. And, and the guy said, I said, I got to get these pants sewed here. I tore this. Oh, he said, come in the back, you know. And, and uh, there was this lady in the back. She said, she'll take care of it for her. And I looked, and she was jaundiced. 
She's Johannes. I said, wow, she's Johannes. I wonder what she's got. And so, <laughs> so I, I got my pants sewed. I said, I'll wait. I'll wait. I'm not too worried. I was worried. <laughs> so anyway, I, told, I went back and I told Dr. Jacob. I said, hey, there's a lady down there. He said, and he sends the chief president down and offers her to come in as a chief uh, teaching case. And she, had, she ended up having uh, cancer to head of the pancreas. So that's the kind of stuff he was doing. Unfortunately, in 1946, 56, he left. He went to Seton Hall, and then he became, that, which later became the New Jersey College of Medicine. He took a job in Worcester as one of the hospitals that was affiliated with Georgetown, and then he ended, he was born for the computer. He was born. He was just 50 years too soon. And he ended up putting the whole of Cleveland's school system on a computer. That's the last I heard of him. Uh, he was putting the whole, uh, I don't know what it was, the library from the city of Cleveland and everything on a computer. But anyway, he was an incredibly interesting guy. And the most, the most interesting thing that he did, he brought in these people who were genuinely interested in learning and teaching and taking care of patients. They were wonderful people. The two that I, uh, I was associated closely with were Harvey and Huffnagel. And, I told you how Dr. Harvey got here, and Huffnagel was an incredible surgeon for this era. He could uh, he he trained in Boston, and he went uh, and he he did surgery on a lot of kids for coarctation and patent ductus for years, and then he then he they Harvey talked Jagers to get him to come down as chief of cardiovascular surgery, and the, 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 all they had, all the two guys had. They didn't have a lot of staff or anything. Poor Dr. Harvey lived in a room that was like a closet with, um, I can't think of his secretary's name, but uh, she, oh, Miss Morrow. She, she was a classic uh, secretary. <laughs> she couldn't do anything. And, she, <laughs> and one, one of the Jesuit fathers asked Proc to take her as a favor, you know, and he said, oh, yeah, I'd be happy to. But anyway, they, they didn't have echocardiogram. They didn't have cardiac catheterization. And they were doing uh, mitral stenosis. They were opening mitral valves. This is in their 50s. They were opening mitral valves and putting aortic valves in the aortic arch. And in 19, um, th 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 think of this, mitral stenosis is 0.0, it was 0.06 to 0.08 seconds, the, the opening snap had to be that close in order to have tight mitral stenosis. And Huffnagel would make an incision in the left side, in the left side, and open up the ribs. And the heart's still beating, you know. There's no bypass or anything. And he puts his, his finger in through the left atrial appendage into the valve and fractures it. That's, that's what they were doing. Then they closed it, and the patient did better. The side effects, of course, was mitral insufficiency. If you, if you opened it too wide, it was too bad. Then eventually they, they learned to put a knife in, but it was blind surgery. It was absolutely blind surgery, and they were treating my... And our wards in the 1950s and 60s were filled with rheumatic heart disease. From all over the world they came. Uh, but you had to have either aortic insufficiency or mitral insufficiency. One morning, I was on the second floor of... Uh, the second floor of the hospital, looking out the window, and I saw this fellow standing there. And I said, who the heck is that? That guy looks familiar. It was Charles Lindbergh. Charles Lindbergh, remember Charles Lindbergh? <laughs> huh? He was the hero of heroes. Well, you know what, you know what his story was? This, this is interesting. He's a big Georgetown guy. You guys don't know this. But Charles Lindbergh, after he flew, and then after they kidnapped his baby and killed it, he, he went to England. And he was interested in developing a pump for heart disease. He, he, he was interested in developing a pump for heart disease. And he, his, his sister-in-law, his wife's sister, yeah, sister, wife's sister had mitral stenosis. And he, what he thought was you could just take the heart out like you take out an engine in the, uh, you know, in a, like in an, in an airplane. And he, he said, just take the heart out, put it here. You need a new valve, go get one and put it in there and then put it back in. That, that was his 
fundamental thinking of it when he heard about it, and then he realized the complexity of it. And he worked with this guy, I can't think of his name now, I, I wish I could think of it, but in New York at the, um, what the heck was the name of it? At the, at the Rockefeller Institute. What was the guy's name? You, remember? you, you know, who, I mean, the French guy. Alexis huh? Alexis yeah, Alexis Carroll. He, he won the Nobel Prize, and they worked, they were working on a punt, a uh, pump for a cardiovascular pump. And Alexis Carroll died during the war. And Mrs. Carroll, Corral, Corral, C A R R E L, she, she gave all of his writings. Alexis Carroll was a French hero. And she gave all of his writings to Georgetown University. And because of that, because of Huffnagel. And then uh, Huffnagel got interested and came down. And he used to hang out in the dog lab here for four or five years. He used to come on, I think, Wednesday afternoon, and he and Dr. Harvey and, and um, Huffnagel would be working and would work in, the, the Harvey didn't work in the dog lab, but Huffnagel, he would work in the dog lab. Huffnagel worked from like seven in the morning to 11 at night. I mean, he was a bear for work. And, uh, but anyway, well, what, what do you want to say? <laughs> <laughs> One of the things about Bob Holman is, <laughs> is I always say, if you, if, you, if you get somebody to replace you, make sure he's better than you are. That's very important because then, you know, he, he reflects back on you in a lot of ways, and that's what's happened with me and he, he and I, whatever. Okay, you're on. Oh, I, uh, okay, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, you want to come? Uh, we would. No, I think you'll come over here. We'll do All the right, Frost okay. Nixon interview. Yeah. Okay. I'll, uh, we'll do the David Frost Richard oh. Nixon interview. Okay. And you've got your mic on. Can you hear me? I think you need to turn your mic on. Okay. So. Um, I'm on. Well, I'll, I'll tell a story about Alexis Carroll. <laughs> um, when I was a first year medical student, I went down into the basement to study in those little horrible little. Um, what are they? Little rooms. They're little tiny oh, at Georgetown? isolation tanks uh, down in the, and there's no windows. And I thought, I really need to stay here for, you know, 14 hours straight and, and read. And I'm sure I'll just, it'll just come right up from the books. And uh, so, um, of course, that lasted for maybe 90 minutes at the most at a stretch. And I would get up and I'd, I'd start to pull all these books off the shelves and try and read them for distraction. And uh, they have all the, the reject books down there. There's nothing down there that's interesting, but there's a room <laughs> down there um, where they had all of Alexis Carroll's papers. And it was yeah. the Alexis Carroll reading room. And uh, they had a shelf of uh, uh, books and a biography of his. And so I, I, uh, I read his biography when I was a first year medical student. I probably should have been studying, but um, <laughs> it was related. Well, then I, I have a patient who's no longer living now, but um, she was a, an older, um, woman who came from a very um, distinguished uh, family background so that um, she learned many, many languages and um, went off to um, the Sorbonne at age 14, her governess in tow and whatnot, and uh, she had all this tutoring. Um, but she was about 17 or 18 or so, and she was working at the Institut uh, Pasteur. Just a young, you know, eager little medical wannabe, I guess. and. Uh, she met Alexis Carroll, and she met him a few times, and uh, she found out uh, somehow that there was a Georgetown thing. She asked me about him, and I told her this story, and she said, you know, the last memory I have of Alexis Carroll is we were out there on this uh, square at the Institute, and uh, he said to her, you know, and mentioned her name, and said, uh, you must, you must, you must have a bowel movement every day. It's very important. <laughs> and so, so decades later, I'm her doctor. And this came up because we were talking about her bowel habits. And I thought, OK. You know, so I, wanted, yeah. <laughs> I thought, OK, well, it is important. I agree. Every day. So, so um, there's the Alexis Carroll connection. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So, so, uh, so Dr. Nolan. Um, <laughs> Have you seen any, any changes in medicine, or what changes <laughs> do you think are the most uh, important uh, well, I, I changes think, in medicine? I think, yes, yeah. I, I think the changes are the changes in disease. You know you're going to go to school for how long? Oh, Four, well, eight, 10, 12, 11. take all the residency. And then when you come out, all the diseases have changed. 
There's all new, and, and my favorite, the disease, of course, as a, as a general internist, the disease that really surprised me along the way was HIV. It was HIV. The first patient I saw with HIV, uh, there were no tests for it. Nobody knew what it was. And it was, I think, a patient that had, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, pseudo, uh, pseudo uh, the crinite, you know. Pneumocystis crinite, yeah. And I'm sure that's what it was now, but I didn't know what it was. It was look, I call it viral pneumonia. And the next patient I saw with uh, HIV was a football player who had Kaposi's. It was all purple legs. He had purple legs. And uh, <laughs> I thought, um, I thought, what the heck is this? But then I had been well trained in dermatology. So <laughs> I, at first, I put, uh, I probably put uh, fungicide cream on it. <laughs> if that didn't clear it, then, uh, then I put uh, steroid on it. <laughs> and then if that didn't clear it, I sent him to the dermatologist. <laughs> well, he didn't know what it was either. But eventually, the guy got a diagnosis at George Washington Hospital, I might say. He went to George Washington. He said, I've had enough of this guy. So he went to George Washington, and they realized it was Kaposi's. I said, Kaposi's? It's something out of the Middle Ages, you know? And then, uh, what else? then I had a patient who was a good friend of mine. I actually had valvular heart disease, and I'd sent him to Georgetown for a valve. And he, uh, he, he that was in the early 80s, and he, he came back about two or three years later. And he came back about every six months with a specific complaint. First he had diarrhea, then he was losing weight, then he had what turned out to be thrush. So if he had, I sent him the dermatologist, I sent him the GI guy, I sent him, you know. <laughs> and nobody knew the diagnosis. And finally he came in one day and he says, hey, uh, do you think I got AIDS? I said, you don't have AIDS. What are you giving me? You don't have AIDS. <laughs> I said, no, I said, I said, I'm not, he says, you don't have AIDS. He said, well, I said, what do you think that? He said, well, my friend's son has AIDS, and he looks just like me, and he has all the same symptoms. I said, oh, that's, yeah, I know, I know. He says, that's, that's, but you don't have it, don't worry about it. He said, well, I'd like to be tested for it. So I got tested, and it came back positive. I says, holy cow, I said, this is a mistake. So I tested him again, and they come back positive. And I tested him a third time, and it came back positive. He had AIDS, and he got it from surgery. He got it from a blood transfusion that he had during time of surgery before they, had, they were testing blood things. So that, 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 that disease just completely surprised me. I never heard of it before. And then all of a sudden, now, you, now every time you think of a differential diagnosis, you say uh, uh, HIV, right? Yeah. But you, you, you have more experience with it than I do. What, what's your, uh, you have a lot of experience with it, right? I guess for the students, I would um, say I went into practice in 1989. I was a fourth year medical student in the fall of 1981. And I remember there was a case uh, in the ICU here of a patient with these funny purple nodules and a very bad interstitial pneumonia. And uh, Dr. Buck Davis, um, Will, where are you? Oh, there you are. OK, your dad uh, cut out the. Uh, MMWR, it was a weekly uh, morbidity mortality weekly report. As medical students, we all subscribed to it, and it was a fairly weird um, publication from the CDC uh, that described, you know, a measles, a measles outbreak in Ohio or something, and it would be Campylobacter, Arizona, and it was all these new outbreaks. It was all uh, ID, um, you know, lead poisoning sometimes it would be. but. Uh, uh, they described uh, in June of 1981 uh, a couple of cases in Los Angeles and New York. Uh, the reason they described them is that the, the lady uh, at the CDC who was the only person who could release pentamidine was all of a sudden getting a lot of phone calls uh, in a big, you know, all of a sudden they're all from these two urban areas. And they started to call these places. Why are you using all this pentamidine? Well, anyway, so they reported this. And uh, that new uh, report, which was just a few months old uh, that fall, uh, got put on that patient's chart. And everybody thought, oh my gosh, we're seeing a brand new disease. And uh, you know, you sort of feel cheated when it's your fourth year medical student. You think, wait a minute, 
we did all that studying, <laughs> and we got a new thing that nobody knows what it's caused by, and what is this? And uh, so uh, that very much influenced my becoming a doctor, because it, it happened right when I was uh, an intern and a resident. I had cases that came in. We didn't have any diagnostic tools. The third, in April of the third year of my residency, the HIV antibody came out. Um, at the beginning of my third year, uh, resident, I did two months in Thailand in a refugee camp with the Georgetown program, and uh, and I was away. I, you know, I didn't have any any contact with the outside world. Once a week, you could take a two-hour bus to a city and get a Time magazine. Um, and I came back, and they had discovered this thing called HIV. And I thought, what do you mean? They've got the, they've got a name for it. They discovered the virus. Uh, since I've been gone, I should never go away that long. Um, <laughs> but all through my residency, we had case after case, every night on call, it seemed, of a 35-year-old who was absolutely breathless with PO2s in the 40s, um, who would come in and then have a horrible rocky course. And um, if they would survive, then they would be uh, back uh, over and over again. The average uh, mortality, or the average uh, survival for someone diagnosed with pneumocystis in the early 80s was six months. So they didn't die of pneumocystis, but then they would die of CNS toxo, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We really, we didn't know. Um, we would learn these things as um, the patients would get sick in front of you. Um, they'd say, oh, this is the first case of CNS toxo that we're seeing in this population. Again, you couldn't identify the patients because we didn't have an antibody test. You'd say, this person probably has this problem, uh, this acquired immune deficiency syndrome because they've had thrush and they've lost weight and they've had diarrhea and um, maybe they've had um, you know, protracted uh, sugarlosis or something. So uh, we were confronted with something that was brand new. And I think I remember um, I went and did my infectious disease training at the NIH and then um, sort of ill-prepared for private practice, left the ivory tower, went into private practice. And I remember my second year in practice. I had a patient who um, had HIV and uh, Kaposi's and several other problems. And I had him on about nine medications, which was then considered a very, very long list. Now it's, you know, I mean, you basically can't get your Medicare card until you're on 12 or 15 medications. <laughs> but um, it was an enormous amount of medications. And I looked at a list of nine medications, and only one of them was in my pharmacology course. And because they were all new fluconazole, acyclovir, zidovudine, didanosine. They were all new medications. Um, and I thought, you know, it's, it's interesting. In education, you get, you get taught the principles, but then, you know, things shift, things change. And, uh, but I didn't think that all of that shifting and change would happen by the time I was a t second year uh, attending. Um, but it did, and it changed rapidly. Um, and I remember um, a couple things during those first six years, because I, it was six years until effective antiretrovirals, the protease inhibitors, came out. And we were really uh, largely doing um, sort of OI control, opportunistic infection control. Uh, these patients were very ill. We'd see them every, every two weeks in the office because there was some other problem that had cropped up. Um, and uh, we didn't have diagnostics for the most part. They just presented with late disease. and. Um, what was interesting is, you know, sort of this, the beginning of the an effective antiretroviral therapy, we were really happy because all we were treating was then the side effects, side effects of these horrible drugs, um, and in not opportunistic infections myself, in themselves. I remember in that period of those first six years how busy I was um, with my clinical practice, my teaching, um, the inpatient consultations, and uh, and everybody was seeming to have my same birth year, but that wasn't always true. They were, you know, plus or minus five or seven or something. And they were all very, very sick. And they, and there's maybe two or three patients that I have since, that have been my patients since about 1990. But for the most part, they've all gone. And uh, I remember how difficult it was for me to think, you know, what am I accomplishing here? Um, everybody's dying. And, um, you know, what's it all about kind of a thing. And I remember trying to um, imagine what I was supposed to be doing. And I remember thinking of um, uh, a thought came to mind, a myth of Sisyphus, 
And I, I'm starting to relate a little too uh, well to that myth where the poor man is condemned forever, and then some, uh, to roll the stone to the top of the hill, to try and get it to the top of the hill. And then invariably there would be a slippage, and the stone would then get out of his grips and then roll all the way down to the bottom. And I thought that was my, my Sisyphean, Sisyphean uh, you know, conundrum here. I was stuck in this horrible thing. And, and uh, I would listen to a friend of mine talk about um, a hospice worker in England named Sheila Cassidy. And uh, she's a, a very uh, devout Catholic and a very good writer. Um, but she w has a book called Good Friday People. And her whole work she was envisioning in hospice was at the foot of the cross. So, you know, familiar Catholic and Christian image. And I thought, that, you know, that was, that was good for a while. But I thought, you know, I can't sustain that day after day. And being a Californian, I thought, you know, I, I need a better met metaphor. Um, and so what I, uh, I, I came across was, you know, going back to my roots. What did I do during my ill-spent youth? I, I, I was at the beach a lot. And uh, when you're a little kid at the beach, um, you know, you do all sorts of things. But as you're, you're a child, you build sandcastles when you're a little afraid of the big waves at Newport. And uh, so I remember um, uh, doing a lot of uh, fun at the beach. And I had had a friend um, who was working with the poor in San Francisco and thinking that he was really going to make uh, a big change uh, in this neighborhood, in the Tenderloin. And another friend who was at the dinner said, well, you know, I, I know you're going to do a lot of good. He said, but I, I, you really, you know, don't expect that the whole, whole thing's going to change because you want it to or you're working hard. Just think of it as just pouring sand, uh, pouring water on sand. You're not going to turn the sand into the ocean. Uh, you're going to be doing the same thing. And, but just, you know, you should think about this. So, so I was thinking about this image. Uh, and I was thinking about myself at the beach with the red plastic bucket running up and down <laughs> at the age of eight. And I thought, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm doing the same thing that my friend Jim was doing. He's uh, taking water, you know, not like the, uh, unlike the stone, but I'm trying to turn the, the beach into a big lake there behind my sandcastle. And, uh, and I thought, you know, this isn't such a bad metaphor because I really like the beach. And um, there's a breeze, uh, <laughs> sunny, the sky is brilliant blue. The, somebody's got their transistor radio or their <laughs> iPhone on, and there's music, and there's lots of friends, and there's seagulls that are squawking, and the waves are crashing, and you can smell the salt air. And I'm having a ball. And I realize that's a lot of what working in the hospital with very, very sick patients was like for me. There's the students. Uh, there's the house staff, the nurses, the, my colleagues. We're all having a great time. We're doing incredible work. And it may not work that, you know, our goal to really give health to this person, whether this person is dying or whether they've just got an intractable illness, we're really trying to help them. And we're doing our professional best. But um, sometimes what you, you do it because that's what you do. You're at the beach. You're a Californian. You play at the seashore. And yeah, you try and put the lake behind the sandcastle. But the fact that you don't ever get the lake to work behind the sandcastle or the moat, you know, it, it isn't the point. The point is you really, really love what you do. And you're having fun. You have tremendous collegiality with your buddies. And, uh, and yeah, there's this incredibly um, high-mindedness uh, you don't really usually find at the beach uh, about <laughs> your, your task of, of, of serve it, serving others uh, who are greatly in need. And uh, so during those years, I needed a metaphor shift. And <laughs> I sometimes bounce between metaphors. Uh, but I, I like that metaphor a lot better, uh, certainly, than the, uh, the Sisyphean stone. Good. So That's um, very good. So that's, that's, that's my experience. <laughs> So, so um, but I think what's interesting is that things have changed. Things have changed again and again and again. And uh, uh, there'll be, you guys are going to, you think, oh, there's so much change around the corner. But, I mean, we, we, we didn't think that we could manage this horrible epidemic uh, 25 years ago or 30 years ago. And, um, 
you know, it's interesting. I, I just not to talk too long because I'm interviewing yeah. you. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, no. I, Shaker showed me his his iPhone today, and uh, he has some pictures from Cameroon. And uh, he said, "What's this? What's this?" He was trying to snuff me. And, uh, I, I did I get it? Shaker, where are you? Okay, and Shaker, how'd I do? Okay, thanks. Okay, we'll, we'll keep talking. Okay, uh, so. Uh, so he pointed to this really misshapen, deformed leg. That, and I thought, you know, it's got to be elephantiasis. It's horrible venous stasis. There's got this unrecognizable skin. And then I guess what's beyond that is skin, I guess. And I said, oh, well, it's got to be capaces. And he said, yeah, it is. And it was just completely infiltrating the whole lymphatic system and the whole skin. And it was about, you know, two feet by, you know, a foot. And I saw a patient about... Um, nine years ago, and I actually saw him in the basement of my church, he wasn't a patient of mine actually, uh, getting a glass of water, and he was limping, and I said, oh, how's your, your leg? He said, oh, it's really horrible, and he said, are you a doctor? I said, yeah, and uh, he said, well, let me show you my leg, and he pulled it up, and he had this incredible, just like your picture, incredible, I mean, you couldn't see normal skin, it was all black, raised, indurated, thickened, um, not even purple, it was just sort of black. And I said, well, you know, I don't know the story. And I'm like, well, I don't have my white coat on. And I'm you know, looking around. I'm like, um, are you taking any medications? No, why would I be taking medications? I said, okay. And I didn't realize at the time that he was um, in a great, great state of denial. But I finally told him, I said, you know, I think you might have HIV. Well, I don't have HIV, you know, really quickly. And I said, okay, well, anyway. He got, I re sent him to the Whitman Walker Clinic, and he saw four physicians there. And all four physicians have a lot of experience being HIV. And all four of them said, this is not a disease. Um, and uh, they said, we'll have to do some skin biopsy, must be something else. And I thought that was so interesting, because that was a disease that we saw in the early 90s. But flash forward to 2003 or four. Even at the Whitman Walker Clinic, they didn't, they didn't have enough familiarity. So the diseases change. Um, and I think you just have to you know, recognize and adapt to it. Yeah. Back right. to you. What do you, what do you want to know? Um, <laughs> huh? Should we open the floor? Okay. Open, open up. <laughs> What's going to be on the shelf? <laughs> oh, come on. I think one of the, um, I think one thing that's very definitely going to happen is there's going to be a lot of changes in medicine. And the second thing is you're not going to be able to figure out what they are. <laughs> so don't worry about them. You'll go with them. You'll flow with them. Most of the people that practice medicine, in 19... Um, 65, I was sitting in the Arlington cafeteria with a, fellow, a urologist that was just retiring, and it was the day Medicare was going into effect. And it was one of the days. And it was, that was October of 65. Because I was actually, in October 65, uh, Paul Dudley White. Did anybody ever heard of Paul Dudley White? Oh, man. Paul Dudley White was Eisenhower's doctor. He was the greatest cardiologist. There's only four cardiologists in the United States in 1932. He was one of them. And he, got, he was in my office, my dinky little office. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And I'm over there in my dinky. office. The phone rings, and it's uh, Lyndon Johnson. I said, who? <laughs> Lyndon Johnson. It wasn't him. It was one of his people. He said, we heard Dr. White was there, and we want him at the White House because we're taking the picture tomorrow when I signed the bill for, the, uh, for Medicare. And, and Paul Dudley White says, uh, tell him I'm not here. I says, okay. I said, well, he hasn't gotten here yet. He says, okay. So about 15 minutes later, he calls. And this time it is Paul Dudley White. I mean, uh, it's President Johnson, Lyndon Johnson. He didn't take no. He says, put him on. He, I could hear the voice in the background. So my secretary, he said, I think it's him. So he gets him. <laughs> <laughs> and Paul Dudley White says, Paul Dudley White says, no, uh, he says, uh, uh, I, he says, I, he says, I'd love to be there, and he says, I don't know how you track me down, but 
but he says, and I, he said, I'd love to be there, but I'm not gonna, I, I can't make it. I have another commitment here with the good doctors here, and I have hundreds of doctors waiting to see him. Of course, it was just me. So he, anyway, he turned him down. And so then he says, I don't know whether this thing's gonna be good or bad or what it's gonna be, but I'm not getting up there and let him use me. And, and with a bunch of people who have to have a picture taken, you know, and then 50 years from now, they say, look at Paul Dudley White was off for uh, uh, Medicare or whatever, Medicaid. And uh, now, so then anyway, we went out to the cafeteria and it was a urologist and a grumpy old guy and he was retiring. And he said, you guys, boy, he says, you, he says, I feel sorry for you guys starting out. He said, oh man, it's going to be awful, man. <laughs> we were there for the golden age. We were there for the golden age. He said, our group had it. That was 1965. So fast forward to Oscar Mann, <laughs> who's the current, who's a retired local doctor, internal medicine. He says, boy, we were lucky. He says, we were lucky. He said, we were there for the golden era. <laughs> we had the golden era. I say that all the time. I said, we had the golden era. But you're going to have the golden, golden era. It's going to be better. Because it keeps, because everybody likes it. The doctors like what they're doing. And then I got a call three months ago from a classmate of mine whose name happened to be Donovan. <laughs> <laughs> and he said he was sitting there with his wife. He's in Florida. He's sitting there with his wife, and he was going over everything, and he said he had to share with someone in the class how much he really enjoyed. He had to tell somebody how much he really enjoyed being a doctor and how much he loved it. And uh, he just had a call from it. So then we sat there for two hours telling stories about making them up. Most of the can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> and we sat there for it was two hours. And I'm going to call him tonight and tell him I use his name again. But but he said we were there for the golden eras. I pity these poor guys today. I said don't pity them. They got it made. They got the golden era. It's coming up. We we're going to be out of there. So you're not going to be there for the golden era. You got the golden era. You got the golden. Era. Just focus on what you want to be. In medicine, there's so many opportunities, you can't make up your mind. The right, Dr. Harvey? Dr. Harvey could either be an internist or a GP. You don't want to go back to Youngstown, right? Or to stay at Hopkins. So he stayed at Hopkins. He used to become an intern. And, and, uh, and, uh, but he had two choices. If, he got, if they gave him all the choices you guys got, he could never make his mind up. He got about 200 choices. That's what the trouble is. Uh, there's too many choices. Pick one. <laughs> we had a lady here. Did you hear about that? You know, there's a freshman. I won't identify the guy, but her mother was here for the white coat ceremony, and and uh, I was telling her. Uh, I introduced her. My grandson was there, and uh, Jack, and, and she said, "Well, where are you going to school?" And he says, "I, I don't really know." He said, "I'm." He's a senior in high school. I said, I don't know. I might go here. I might go there. I don't know. I don't care. Because. She says, pick one, for God's <laughs> sake. <laughs> <laughs> she said, you'll love it. <laughs> and that's the truth. Stop worrying about it. Just pick one and go do it. How can you like something you're not even trained to do? So I don't know whether I'm going to be a cardiologist or an internist or what. You're not even trained for that yet. Go get trained. And then if you don't like it, then go to something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. How can you like? How can you pick something you don't even know what it's going to be like? Just pick something and go. <laughs> and, and it's a golden era coming up. Golden era. Good. Right, right, John. Oh, yeah. yeah. I have a quick question. So it, it seems that it's very clear that the profession is changing and changing very fast. Yeah. Um, and. I know Georgetown does a fantastic job in, in reinforcing the importance of, of a good physical and a good history. Yeah. And I know Dr. Harvey used to mention the five pillars of diagnosis. But it's also clear that you know, the profession is also changing. It's becoming very bio, biochemistry centric and procedures. And we're going away from, from times where you know, just by uh, observing a patient and, and trying to elicit particular signs, it was enough to, to make a diagnosis. How can we, uh, in this new era, uh, try to keep that tradition of, of being really good at, at taking really good histories and, and, um, and physical? So basically, what's, what's your advice uh, in the years to come to get that fantastic exposure? Keep doing to? it. Keep doing it, you get good at it, and you get quick at it. And you'll be able to do it, whatever field you're going in, orthopedics or eye 
or whatever, get to be, get, develop the experience. The first thing is what? Opportunity, you got it. What's next? Talent, you got that, right? The third one is work. You know how many, what's that book, that book I like? Outliers. Some of you have read yeah. it, right? How many hours does it take? 10,000, 10, right. It takes a doctor longer. Probably t I said, I don't know why he didn't use doctors in there. That's perfect. It takes 10,000 hours to get good at physical diagnosis. And you can just keep doing it. And you'll get better and quicker at it, but it takes time. It takes experience. Just keep doing it. If you drop it, you get, you won't, in five years, you won't know what, what to do. You won't have the confidence to come back. Keep doing it. And you get better and better and better. You'll have good days and bad days. And, and uh, keep doing it. But everything is uh, supplemental, you know, or complementary, that's a better word. Complementary. The, the EEG, the echo, the, uh, they complement the physical exam. The physical exam, uh, an echo is a good example. If you just get an echo on everybody, you're going to find everybody's got T I M I A I. Just fraction, you know, you read it. If you don't hear the murmur, they don't have TI. If you don't hear the murmur, they don't have MI. That's how simple they can eliminate. Otherwise, they keep getting echoes every... That's why the expense... That's what's where, the, where all the money is, is being spent. You know, on repeat examinations. If you, can, you, can, you can use the physical exam. And then you have to develop enough confidence to have confidence in doing it. You know, that, takes, that takes time. I had, I had a doctor one time who, uh, we had a, pa it really showed me something. We had a, pa a young patient with uh, 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 meningitis, no cockle meningitis, and the, and the patient was in extremis. And uh, Dr. Tumpton, and he says, um, that he, the patient gave a history of sensitivity to penicillin, and it's the only uh, drug that the patient, uh, that the drug, the bug was sensitive to. And he says, there's no choice. <coughs> and everybody said, well, you get sued, or you get, he said, there's no choice, you gotta get penicillin. So he gave penicillin, I said, man, that guy, that's, that's God's ball, man. <laughs> that's really, and it turned out, the, the history was in default. The history was inaccurate. And the patient did fine. But boy, when he, he said that, man, I mean, that, that, but that's the kind of stuff doctors have to do. You, have to do. you can't be intimidated. You've got to have the courage of your convictions. But it's a great, hey, it's a great, it's a great, but you guys are so lucky. And don't be moaning and crying, God. <laughs> <laughs> How bad you have it, holy God. People can't stand to hear that, you know? <laughs> Go tell your mother and your father how lucky you are, and how lucky you are to have them and to be part of it. And, and if they, whatever sacrifice they gave, they do it. But don't be a, a, a whiner, find a positive side of it. You know, I know, that, I know it doesn't, it, it, it costs a lot, right? But it's worth it. And you're worth every penny. This <laughs> John's man. Dr. Nolan, I have a question for you. I'm on my AI with uh, Dr. Holman right now, and he likes to poke fun at us. Uh, you know, patients don't lay in bed. They lay eggs and uh, things like that. Um, I was wondering if you have any uh, good stories about Dr. Holman. <laughs> <laughs> don't we end at 7.30? It's 7.37 back there. I know. I wish I did. How about that? I don't, I really can't, I really can't. Uh, I wish I did. How about that dengue fever case? Oh, yeah, the de oh, yeah, well, I always, I used to refer patients to him, uh, you know, <laughs> and I had, yeah, I, have, I had a case of, uh, this woman came in with a headache and fever and everything. She gave a history of going to the islands and so forth, and, and she came two or three times, and, uh, and, uh, she, uh, I kept saying, but I didn't start. She's running a fever and everything, and I said, I'm not starting on antibiotics until I know what I got. That's what I was taught. I'm sticking by it, no matter what. I'm not treating anybody uh, just for the heck of it. I'm sticking by it. So anyway, 
So the husband comes in one time and he says, to me, he says do, do you, uh, he said, do you think my wife, he called me, that's what he did. He called me, he says, hey, do you think my wife has dengue fever? And I'm thinking, who is this guy? What is going on? Where's he getting these things from? I said, uh, well, that's a good thought. And I hung up, you know. I go, <laughs> I hung up, and I went to the textbook. It was classic. It was classic dengue fever. So I called Bob up. I said, hey, I got this classic case of dengue fever. <laughs> and and he, he, he went along with it. Right? <laughs> I did. I called him, and I said, he answered the phone. He goes, hello? Classic. <laughs> and then there's silence, and he laughed. But, no, I, I, don't, I don't know if him, but I'll, I'll have to keep <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I, it's unfair to make up stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Never miss a meeting. I don't, I don't, even, I don't even remember him as a student, frankly. Did you go to school? <laughs> <laughs> Annie O and Dennis Cullen. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I rotated with Dennis yeah, Cullen. John, John. Dennis Cullen and you, you and he were Annie laughing. O, Annie O was the star of the whole section. <laughs> <laughs> she was tough. She was tough. She, she gave the speech at the uh, She did. The awards, I remember. She, she's a, she was tough. Known as Dr. O'Donnell, I think. Dr. O'Donnell. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah, she was good. Okay. Any more questions? No, they, you've always, because things are always changing, you're aware of, of that, that thing that being, no, you're never quite sure of the whole, you know, you think you have everything under control and then figure out something happens and you, uh, it's the same with all of us, you know, everybody will admit it, but it's just you never quite get to the point. It's like, uh, uh, it's like Paul Wood, the great British cardiologist, when he was here, somebody said, how long does it take uh, to, uh, to get good at auscultation of the heart? He was the world's expert. He said, you start to get good at it just when you start losing your hearing. <laughs> 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 and, I, and I think that's as you get older, you, you, you lose some of your, you, you, you can't remember a lot of things that, that uh, are good. You know? just have to hang in. But I, 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 I think the thing about the way to develop confidence is to uh, is to keep doing things over and over. You know, to keep doing it, keep doing it. It'll, it'll be different each time, but you keep doing it. And uh, the, the thing is good. For the women, I think it's important for them to, they, they got more decisions to make. It's, it's important for them to stick with medicine through the whole family thing. You don't take off a year or two and things like that. Don't do that. I use my uh, experience as a father. <laughs> I wanted to stay at home. But when I ha wanted to coach baseball for my kid, so I would, I would uh, when, when April came, March, end of March to end of June, I would cancel hours in the afternoon so I could go out the back. I, and the big thing about it, and, and the number one rule is don't tell me. <laughs> But they'll complain. But you don't tell anybody. Take an afternoon off. Don't tell anybody. Have, have two places. These are words of advice. Have, have two places to go at all times. That's why it makes Arlington such a great job. <laughs> you say, where are you? I'm, I'm, I'm on my way to Arlington. Then you go here. <laughs> I'm on my way to Georgetown. I'm on my way to Georgetown. I said, I, what's his name? Uh, there's a great football player in Washington called Paul Lobby. He, he used to always kid me about that. He heard me say that. And he does that now with his job. He's got a big family, he's got five, six kids, he wants to go. So he tells his secretary, I'm going to our office over in uh, Springfield Street. I'll be, you know. And then he takes off and plays baseball with his friends. But, uh, but that's what you do. And then you go back at night and you keep it up. And it, but there's certain things you have to pace your life. But the biggest thing is, not to lose touch with, with medicine, because then you lose your confidence. You lose your confidence. I, when I went 
the service, I felt that when I came back. And I went in service a couple of weeks. I came back even then. All the medicines were different. You know, I felt. So I thought, but just get, jump back in and go do it. You know. Keep seeing patience. Keep seeing patience. That, Paul Dudley White, Paul Dudley White, he, he snubbed Johnson. He said, that's your social security. You're worried about social security when you're not going to have it? He said, don't worry about it. If you got it, if you can take care of patients and you're a doctor, you've got your social security. That's your social security. That's your social They'll need you. They will always need doctors to take care of patients. One third of all the doctors in the United States now full time are not practicing medicine. That's ridiculous. No wonder there's a shortage. So what so Keep seeing patients. That's your social security. Say, hey, I'm looking for a doctor. Hey, I'm here. Right? Yeah. Dr. Holman, when you were a medical student at Georgetown, was there a physician here who influenced you most? Yes. Um, actually, Dr. <coughs> Dr. Nolan was my uh, clerkship director when I was doing my acne internship. But he was, it wasn't until March or April, so I was already at my fourth year. So I was already <coughs> sort of in my big me stage. Um, but I sort of felt that I had been formed. Um, uh, the residents that I had, um, I thought were terrific. Um, some of the attendings that I had, um, there's one in particular, uh, Jim Winchester, who was in the nephrology division here. Um, and Dr. John Harvey. Um, I met Dr. Harvey uh, as a first year student. And I remember when I was a, we were off at a retreat that they used to have to battle uh, student grumpiness. And they put the faculty and the students together, bring out psychologists from La Jolla um, to help us, uh, you know, relate. And um, so I got to, got to meet uh, Mrs. Harvey and Dr. Harvey and we friends. But I remember um, uh, Tom Kennedy in my class uh, later that year and into second year, we would uh, go around with Paul Cantor, one of the pulmonary docs, and Tom would say, hey, hey, we're, we're not too far from Dr. Harvey's office. Let's go visit him. And we were so clueless second year in our little white coats, and, and uh, we'd uh, go sit in his waiting room, and he had several patients there that he was seeing, and and we just said, well, hi, we just wanted to come by and say hi. And he said, oh, it's so great to see you. Thank you very much. And then he can go back to work. And I don't know why he did this. But <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, so uh, there were a number of people. I can't remember one particular. Um, but later on, there was a, a doc in my internship, uh, the program director, Ken Walker, who was an absolute uh, looming large psychic presence sort of like the moose probably was, um, who really um, struck fear into all of our hearts. And he was a great uh, doctor, great diagnostician, um, very much caring about his patients. Uh, we used to have, um, when you were on night float, you'd have to present the patients at the bedside with the team that was on call that day to accept the patients with the chief resident and the uh, program director, that was Dr. Walker, every morning at 7 o'clock in a big city hospital with sometimes eight-man rooms, and you'd be all crowded around, and, um, and he, he would contradict you know, what he said all the time. So that, that can't be true. Mr. Jones, tell me about this. And I was just brilliant. Um, and uh, I came back as a resident, and uh, Dr. Nolan was a big influence. Because um, I remember rotating over at uh, Arlington with Dr. Nolan and Annie O and a bunch of people. That was a lot of fun. Dr. Rackley was the chairman when I was uh, a resident and when I was chief resident. And uh, he was very uh, influential as well. But I, um, when I went into private practice, I was uh, trying to decide what I was going to do. And I ended up in Arlington. And uh, Dr. Nolan said, well, I, have, I need some help. Maybe you can be the residency director. And so I, I uh, sat with Dr. Rakowski and Dr. Nolan and Dr. Santangelo for about 11 years. And um, we did this incredible uh, show for a long, long time. It was absolutely hilarious. But I, I learned a tremendous amount uh, every morning 
uh, from Dr. Nolan, and uh, we always went to the bedside. And uh, one of his great tricks uh, was to spell in front of patients so that they wouldn't understand. And I remember one of his last, <laughs> one of his last, last days, we had a patient who presented with uh, a, a several month history of progressive fatigue, finally some exertional dyspnea, and um, she finally came to the doctor's office, was referred in to the uh, hospital, and uh, the house staff admitted her, and she had a hematocrit in the teens, and um, so we went around the next day and uh, uh, to visit with her, and uh, Dr. Nolan remembers this, I think. He, He's examining her, and she's got very lax abdominal musculature, and she's about 72 or so, and he can feel, you know, something coming in that part of our quadrant, and, and so he uh, does all the medical students and myself, and they don't think she's got M-A-S-S here, and, and uh, he obviously is palpating a large serial mass, and, uh, and he said, and, and uh, thank you so much for letting us come by and visit with you. I hope you have a very pleasant stay here at the kingdom, at the magical kingdom. And, uh, and uh, so he, uh, uh, he said, do you have any questions? Yes, yes I do, doctor. What kind of a mask do you think I have? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, but I know you got some great students here taking good care of you. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Brett, you were you were around in those days. The same conversation ten years later. I remember going to the bedside with both of you. Both of you were my first uh, first year and second year back in the late '80s, and I remember Dr. Nolan grabbing my hand. Feeling here, not there, feeling here. I remember those days very well. With that, I think we'll wrap it up for a little bit over time. Thank you so much for being here.